But in today's presentation, what I'd like to look at is the language of disability and the language of disorders from the perspective of being a sibling. So this is my brother, Jarlath. And for me, um, I suppose he has shaped my whole world. He has shaped who I am as a personal and very much who I am as a professional. So what I want to look at today is looking at something like a what is described as a neurodevelopmental disorder when it's somebody that you love, um, how we need to move towards more inclusive language, then I want to look at what actually happens in adulthood and what's actually happening there because that's the stage that I'm at with my brother and with my family and there are lots of challenges there moving out of the whole realm of childhood. So Jarlath was born when I was nine years old. He's the youngest of five children. He's got four older sisters and I never know if he should be envied or pitied about that. Um, but he's henpecked from all angles all of the time, but the, the, the poor thing. But I remember being nine and realizing that as he was going through, you know, his first couple of months, whispers started and there was something wrong. And I remember having really high anxiety about this baby, this baby who was absolutely adorable. So he had William syndrome, which we didn't know at the time, so it made him extremely sociable. So when he was out, he'd be in his buggy and he'd be waving at everybody. Hiya! Hiya! And he was just adored by everybody. So I suppose by age 11, when I had seen that he wasn't reaching developmental milestones, all I wanted to do at that stage was move away to a desert island with him and come back and prove to everybody all the things he was actually able to do. That was at age 11. But being Charlotte's sister has been hugely influential for who I am. Um, I suppose in many ways he has shaped my career. I started off as a primary school teacher. Um, I went into the inspectorate. I was an inspector with the Department of Education and Skills and I had responsibility for special education in the west of Ireland. I then moved to Mary Immaculate College where I um, teach student teachers on inclusive educational approaches. And I did a doctorate on the inclusion of children with Williams syndrome. Um, I've written a book about it. How many people here have inspired national research? My brother has. How many people here have inspired a book to be written? My brother has, says she proudly again. Okay, so I am unashamedly proud of all that he's been able to do. Now, the very interesting thing at the book launch, he didn't write a word, but he was the inspiration. You would think he had sweated over this book. He told on the way down to Limerick for the book launch, he said to me in the car, talking about assumptions, Martin, he said, I just want to say to you, it doesn't matter to me if I sign the books before you or after you. <laughs> but the assumption was he was signing the books. Um, and I think if we were talking about, you know, art or music, I'd be saying that Jarlath is actually my muse. It's, it's never that, that nice, I suppose. Um, it, we don't have nice words for that in, in academia. But I remember being really, um, I suppose, opened up to the idea of how influential language is from a very young age. Jarlath had his first psychological assessment when he was three. And the outcome of that assessment was that the level of Jarlath's impairment is so significant that he will probably never ask a question still feel the hairs rise in the back of my neck because that was damning and it was also incredibly incorrect. Last year, Jarlath was invited to be the guest speaker at the opening of the University of Durham's Centre for Developmental Disorders. He is a wonderful advocate for people with Williams syndrome. He is a wonderful person and he is by far my favourite sibling. I just feel that the medical profession have got to be educated on the language of hope because we know the power of expectations. I certainly know the power of teacher expectations. They are the most influential single factor in how a child will do at school. Imagine just what we expect. So if I believe my child is not going to achieve, I'm not going to invest the same level of time and energy. If I do think my child can achieve, I will. And that's what ended up happening in our house. With four older siblings, there was always somebody doing something with them. And we all brought something very different to his development. What was interesting was that at age 14, Jarlath was diagnosed with Williams syndrome. And I was 23 at the time. I was a young primary school teacher. And for me, again, the language of the diagnosis was really important. People talk about diagnosis not being important. And I would argue very strongly with that. The diagnosis gave us an awful lot of answers. I wasn't carrying some kind of a gene that I was going to pass on if I had children myself, because he was the only boy. We didn't know. 
We no longer were worried about his life expectancy being affected, which to me was the single most important thing to have found out. We found out ways that we would be able to support him to learn better. We didn't have to be reinventing the wheel. And we also had a community of belonging. We met with other people who had the same condition. And when we talk about friendships, Martin, there is a great sense of friendship in some of those communities, despite the common denominator being disability. Unfortunately, when you look at some of the, the language around rare genetic conditions, they tend to be represented in very negative terms. So if you find out your baby has been diagnosed with a condition like Williams syndrome and you go on the internet looking for information, you will be faced with a wall of negativity. And this to me is the most damning thing in the language. We find out all of the things that can go wrong, that might go wrong. They're all of the, the, the sob stories. And nobody's shouting about how wonderful these people are as human beings. Yeah, they have Williams syndrome, but that's a by the way. It's only a very small part of who they are. And I really resent that because people make all sorts of assumptions about my brother. And I'm sometimes, even still, I sometimes have to do a double take when I realize somebody is not seeing what I see because I don't see the disability in Jarlath. I only see Jarlath. Part of the issue is that we don't have funding for rare genetic conditions. This is a really big issue. As you know, there is a lot of awareness about autism, and it's because it occurs far more um, commonly than many other conditions. Um, we even see with Down syndrome that there's a you know there, we've about 150 years of research on a condition like Williams on Down syndrome because it occurs more regularly than let's say Williams syndrome. But for the very rare conditions, it's very hard to gather data because there are so few people with it. So it means it's very difficult to be able to find out exactly what the needs are and to generalize with a larger population. When Charlotte was asked to do the presentation in the University of Durham for the opening of their neurodevelopmental disorders um, center, he said to me, I, I don't mind doing it, but do I have a disorder? And I said to him, well, I don't think you do. I said, it's just, it's kind of just the words that people use. I said, well, you know the way you've got Williams syndrome? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, like, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? And he said, it just is. I just have it. It's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just who I am. So I'm always alarmed when language has been used in that kind of a way and it causes somebody to doubt themselves and get, doubt their value in society. What I think we need to be looking at is not so much the world of disability. We need to be looking at the world of enablement. These people are not actually disabled. The only way they are disabled is by us as able-bodied people and our limitations for them. But actually, we all need to be enabled in different ways. So if I need support with something, I can pick up the phone. I can enroll myself on a course. I can read a book. I can set an alarm on my phone. I can make a to-do list. I have all these ways to be able to self-regulate and support myself to be the best I can be. Jarlis doesn't have that ability to be able to do that all the time by himself. Some of those things he can do, some of those things he struggles with. And that's where I need to be an enabler as his sister. So I don't see disability. I only see the ways that I can enable him and the ways that I fail to do that. So when we look at disability, all we should be looking at is the way society has failed our people who are different in some way to the majority of the population. And that leads us to the whole idea of, you know, ultimately, we need to have inclusive language. We need to have inclusive language on the media. Nobody is suffering from Williams syndrome, thank you very much. They quite simply have it. We need to hear inclusive language in our communities and we need to see it on official documents. But it definitely needs to move into the different professions so that we are talking about our people with great respect. If we're looking at the, removing the word dis from disorders and disability and so on, we need to look at the whole concept of inclusion as well. And if you look at inclusion in education, this is my own field, basically. So Bram Norwich in the UK will say that we don't need to talk about inclusive education because education by its very nature is supposed to be inclusive. The problem is, it isn't. And I think we have gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole by, you know, having this debate about special schools or mainstream, special schools or mainstream. And I think we could kid ourselves very easily by closing down all the special schools and saying we now have an inclusive education system. 
we need to move away from that debate and we need to start talking about inclusive learning because actually that's what matters. And I nearly forgot about this. Sorry, I'll just move on to that. That is what came out of my research with people with Williams syndrome. This is an inclusive learning profile. These are all the things that they need to be able to learn inclusively, regardless of what educational context they're in. Mainstream or special, it didn't matter. And the outcomes were similar in both. I need, as a teacher, to stop focusing on, on academics. Because if I have sensory needs, I can't learn. If I can't hold my pencil, my physical needs are affecting my academics. If I have emotional issues, if I can't regulate my emotions well, it's going to affect my behaviour. That's going to affect my social um, relationship with, with the children in my class. It's going to affect my participation and engagement and so on. So this is what we need to be talking about, not where the education will take place. And I think if we had this as a precursor to the inclusion debate of special schools or mainstream, then we can be guaranteed good quality learning by all children with the so-called disability. This is what I show to the students all of the time. How do you know I have a learning disability? Maybe you have a teaching disability. I actually think teaching disability is, has far greater prevalence than learning disability. Okay? So, I think where we need to go with this is we need to have a national rollout of professional development for teachers. Interesting that the curriculum changed in 1999 and teachers got in service on all of the different curriculum areas. Nobody mentioned differentiation, nobody mentioned meeting needs of pupils, even though this was a significant change in the curriculum. Now we can't expect teachers to suddenly be able to cater for a wide range of needs. It's not easy and I'll be the first to say that. We need to give them the skills and the confidence. Attitude is the single, single biggest factor when it comes to inclusive education. Teachers need to be happy to have this child in their class and know that they can do what's best for this child. CPD is needed. We need additional supports for teachers like the Special Education Support Service. They are called out more often for behavioural issues than any other issue. Behaviour is a significant issue in schools. We need to provide supports for schools and also for parents, like the incredible years that has currently been rolled out by um, NEPS. And I think as part of this, we need to clamp down with national policy on the whole idea of having reduced days. So some children with behavioural issues, some children with some kind of needs will very often be put on a reduced day in their school. And I've been involved in some of those cases where I, I go in to observe a child and offer support to a school, and in many cases, there is no reason for it. So I think that needs to be something that is written into policy. Reduced days should not be facilitating the teacher, they should be facilitating the child if they really need it, and there needs to be a plan for increasing their time in school all of the time. The other aspect of this is getting funding for rare genetic conditions is so rare. Um, it is so much easier to have a condition that is very well known and then we know exactly what to do. We have found, we run a summer school for children with Williams Syndrome in Mary Eye every summer and we have now found that a lot of the interventions that are used for children with autism are working very well for our children with um, Williams Syndrome. So we obviously would need funding on a much larger scale and I am also predicting that that would be true for many of the other rare genetic conditions like Fragile X, Angel Man and so on. They seem to share a lot more in terms of their profiles than we have previously believed. But I think through education, if we're focusing on inclusive learning in all of those areas, we will have people, regardless of what school they've gone to, who can participate much more fully in their communities and that is ultimately the goal of education. That also has a spin-off for me as a sibling, because the more independent that my brother is, the less I have to do when my parents die. So let's cut straight to the chase. When we go to adult services, what has been learned at school is, in many cases, the only learning that is going to happen for the rest of that child's life. And from my brother's perspective, the adult service he's in is nothing more than a babysitting service. He's a very able young man. He plays bingo at work. He goes for walks and he has cups of tea with his buddies. That's it. He has Williams syndrome and a mild general learning disability. He is capable of a huge amount more. Where do we go? Adult services in the west of Ireland, you're expected to be grateful for whatever service is given to you. You can't mix and match. You can't turn around and ask for something different. Because if you do, you'll be told you lose that place. And you're expected to be very grateful for it. And we have parents who have been fighting the fight for 20 years. 
they are getting older, they are getting tired, and they've lost some of the fight. And this is where siblings need to come in. It is really challenging because as this opens up for me as a sibling, I have to balance my relationship with my brother and my relationship with my mother. And I would actually say at this, this point, I have sacrificed my relationship with my mother to be an advocate for my brother. And that's the reality of families with somebody with a disability. I believe my brother is capable of much greater independence. My mother believes he needs to be protected more. Where do we go? It's a stalemate. So I think um, when we look at my, my proposals for the end of this, I think education needs to be a key component to the employees who work in um, adult services, not just social care. There needs to be an educational component to continue to develop skills and information that these people need to be more able to participate in the, society, the societies in which they live. We need personnel to link with families and facilitate discussions about the future so that we can maintain all relationships in a family. We need to have supports for parents who can help their child to be more independent as their child is an adult, because that would also make their lives easier. There's something really inappropriate about mothers putting their 40-year-old sons into a shower. We need to give mothers a break, and we need to enable these adults as well. And above all, I think we need supports in the community for employers to involve people with a range of different abilities in society. And last of all, I think there's a role here for community groups. And here we will see, can you click play on that? It does come up at the bottom. Maybe you could just click on... Anyway, this is Charlotte. We have um, a support um, network through Mayo Concert Orchestra and they do a concert in aid of William Syndrome every 21st of June. Now, this is where the prostitution comes in. To raise funds for lesser known conditions, you have to prostitute yourself out there. So when this was on the radio and it was being advertised, somebody says, I heard Fanula Tynan's condition again. They all think I am the one with William Syndrome, <laughs> uh, which is fine. Um, but we have this concert every year. Jarlett sings a song at it and maybe it doesn't, that's fine. Um, and he conducts the Radetzky March. So he does an amazing job and he gets everybody on board and he is so much part of the community. And he is celebrated not for his disability, but for his ability. And that's where I think we need to be going. That is my vision for 2030. Okay, thank you.